Good morning, everyone. We're just about ready to get going. Um, I want to bring your attention to the schedule. We we have no programming uh, November the 11th or the 25th due to holidays, so just want to make sure that you're aware of that. And then on November the 18th, we've got a homeowner chemical and PPE safety class by David Oates, uh, who is uh, the agent in Jefferson County. We have a terrific speaker for you this morning. Ginger Easton Smith comes to us from uh, Aransas County, where she's uh, the agent there. And she's going to talk to you about uh, gardening for hummingbirds. So let me uh, turn this over to Ginger. Uh, we ask that you would mute your cell phones and that you would uh, and that you would mute your audio also and turn off your video if at all possible so that the process runs so much smoother this morning. Uh, with that said, uh, welcome Ginger Easton Smith. You're muted, Ginger. Well, you told me to mute, right? You told us to mute our microphone, so I did. Yes, I didn't mean um, you to speak, though. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Um, I also wanted to remind people that if they have questions, to please put them in the chat box. And the uh, there's a little icon at the top um, you can click on, and then you can enter your message. So I'm going to get started with my uh, presentation. Are we cooking with gas? Yes, ma'am, you're good to go. Okie doke. Well, as you know, I'm gonna be talking about attracting hummingbirds to your yard and garden. And uh, this was a hummingbird that we found, a ruby-throated that we found that was kind of, uh, it was a little bit tangled up. It was in this bush and we freed it and, and held it for a minute and then it flew away. but. Holding a hummingbird is like, it's like holding air almost, or holding a dime. They weigh almost nothing. Really, it's really cool. It's very exciting. If you ever get the chance, if you come to uh, the Rockport Hummingbird Celebration in September, and you go to the banding site, you may get a chance to hold a hummingbird. Okay, so here are is a list of 12 hummingbirds that are not uncommon in Texas. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me, some are more common than others. And the one that is most common is the ruby throated at the top there. Um, we also see black chinned sometimes in our area, rufous, broad tailed, those see more than these other ones. When we spot a calliope or an anna's during the hummer, bird celebration here. Um, there's a lot of twittering going on. Um, word gets around, oh, so-and-so has a calliope at their house and uh, on the Hummer Home tours, and so everybody rushes over there to, to see them because it's pretty exciting. Um, it's really hard to tell from the pictures which is which uh, because it depends on how the sunlight is hitting them. Um, it can change a lot. And the one in the bottom right that's a broad tail, that sure looks like a ruby throated, doesn't it? It's got the scarlet uh, scarlet neck, but that is the broad tailed. But just to be aware, they can be a little hard to identify because they look different depending on how the sun is hitting them. So I'm not going to be talking much about hummingbirds themselves. Um, I am a agriculturalist and horticulturalist, uh, not a bird person, but I'm going to be talking about the plants that are attracting hummingbirds and also what they're doing here. Um, they are passing through to store up energy because they are about to make an 800 mile flight across the Gulf of Mexico to their winter home. So when they our big migration in Aransas County comes in September when they're going to their winter home. Of course, there's another migration in the spring, um, but they they go mostly by a different flyway at that time. But it is incredible that this little teeny creature that, like I said, weighs about as much as a dime can fly across the Gulf of Mexico. It's just absolutely incredible to me. So they really have to uh, stock up on food and body fat. They want to increase their body fat by 50%. And so they need to eat about 15, every 15 minutes. And they're going to visit 1,000 to 2,000 flowers per day in order to 
increase their body fat that much. So what they're looking for is shelter, food, and water. The same, same thing everybody, every living thing pretty much is looking for. What we can do is to plant more plants. Um, we especially want to favor native plants, not just because they do well here. Uh, obviously, they're adapted to your area. Native plants are the easiest plants to grow in your area. They need fewer inputs. They can handle cold weather, hot weather, whatever, whatever your weather and climate is, they can handle that. So start with natives. Uh, we can add other plants too, but make sure you have a good base of natives. And we need a lot of levels of plants. So we need big, tall plants like this oak tree. Um, we need smaller trees. We need shrubs, uh, things that are close to the ground, things that are several feet off the ground, because these provide um, different places for them to feed on nectar to perch, to hide, to look for insects, to nest, all kinds of things. So we want to plant now through January. Um, this is our best growing time, our best planting time so that plants can get established, their roots can start growing, and they can be uh, in pretty good shape by the time it gets hot next summer. Also allow ample space. Some of these uh, trees especially can get really large. Some of the shrubs spread a lot. So make sure you've got enough space for the mature plant. And then mulch. Um, I just had to throw that in there. Mulching is so beneficial and we have been having such dry weather here that, it's, that it makes a huge difference to have mulch. So when you plant, add some mulch, just keep it away from the stem or trunk. Okay, so I mentioned that they're looking for shelter and that would be from predators. Um, so they like to have a place to hide under the tree canopy, but they also need open sky in case they have to escape. Um, fox will come in and uh, snatch a hummingbird while they're feeding. Um, so they, they, need, they need some shelter and they also need protection from the weather. They need places to perch and rest and places to build their nests. They might not be building their nests. They're not gonna be building their nests here in the fall on the way to their winter uh, winter home, but some places in some areas and times they're gonna need places to nest. So for that, we want a variety of trees and shrubs, uh, things like oaks, elms, wax myrtle, Sable palms, red bay, yopon, just all the plants you can think of that are that are native are going to be beneficial for, for hummingbirds, for their habitat. So this is this is a picture that's showing the different layers. You've got flowering and other plants that are growing basically on the ground, some that are a foot or two above, several feet above. You've got the oak tree up there pro providing shade and shelter. Got some palms in the back. Um, this is really what we're looking for. This is a good habit habitat for hummingbirds and for other wildlife as well. And of course, they're all interdependent on each other. Okay, so one of the big things, of course, they're looking for is food so they can get that body fat up. And nectar producing plants is what we focus on. They get a lot of energy from nectar producing plants. And they, they often favor trumpet shaped flowers, lots of times reddish, orange, yellow, but they really will go to any color of flower at all and to, any, to most any shape of flower, but they do seem to have a slight preference for the trumpet shaped ones. <clears throat> so sugar is important. Um, but it's not the only food that's needed. Just like us, uh, love that Halloween candy, but we got to eat some other stuff too. So they need vitamins, minerals, protein, and other nutrients, and they're going to get most of those from insects. So we also need to plant insect attracting, attracting plants. And that would be plants that are 
attracting insects because the insects are looking for food, but also because they're looking for shelter because they will hang out and hide from predators in plants and lay eggs and reproduce and all that. So we really need a variety of plants. And hummingbirds are great at catching insects midair. They'll fly around and catch them. And insects are the main thing that they feed their young. So they are extremely important to their diet. We think of them just as uh, drinking nectar or feeding from um, hummingbird feeders, the sugar water mixture, but they really need insects. So the bloom season and duration is important. So when you're selecting plants, you wanna uh, look into when they bloom and make sure you have things that are gonna bloom in the spring and the summer and the fall. And of course you want multiple things blooming at, at all those seasons as possible. And this is a Yopon holly. Uh, you maybe can see the bee on there. Um, hummingbirds are not gonna be eating bees, but it is attracting insects. Um, and we're not, of course, looking so much for pollinator insects for hummingbird food, but just plants that attract insects are usually gonna attract multiple insects. A variety of plants is needed, um, not just for shelter, but for food. And again, at multiple levels and native plants are going to have a greater concentration of insects and spiders. This has been uh, proven through research. Um, so, so that's another reason to concentrate on native plants. Not only are they easier to grow, but they're gonna provide greater concentrations of the insects that hummers need. We want to avoid, avoid insecticides um, because we're defeating the purpose if we're using insecticides when we're trying to attract insects. And here's just a few plants that are known to be good insect attractors. Pretty much anything that flowers is going to attract some insects. So here we have um, a sage or salvia on the left, and then tropical milkweed and palafoxia. So remember, it's uh, the concentration and variety of insects, not the size. We're not looking for any giant mosquitoes like this. Okay, the third main thing that hummingbirds are looking for is water. They've got to have some water uh, to survive, of course, like us. And you could put out a bird bath, but it does need to be shallow or you need to have some, some rocks in there um, so that they so they can stand up. You know, they're little bitty tiny birds. All wildlife prefers moving water to standing water. So if it'd be possible to have a drip fountain or one of those, uh, you know, the water life drips, it's just one little drip, it goes into a bowl. Uh, they're not too hard to make, or you can purchase them. Or a mist system. Um, I've been to a couple houses that have mist sy systems actually just to cool things off on their patio, but the Hummers, the hummingbirds love that. They fly through it and have like a little shower. They can drink. They can they can land on a plant where mist has collected and just drink little teeny droplets from there. Do we have any questions so far? Yes, Ginger, you have one. Uh, they want to know if, uh, well, you have two questions. The, one of them is, are feeders helpful or hurtful to hummingbirds? Which I was fixing to answer it, but we'll feed that question to you. And then the other one wanted to know what the pink mimosa looking plant was in one of your slides, and it looked like mist flower to me, so. Okay, uh, feeders are helpful. Lots of times we might not have enough flowers blooming because of weather or whatever, hurricanes. Um, to provide enough nectar for, for the hummingbirds. So feeders are very helpful. 
And you always want to make the the mixture one part sugar to four parts of water and dissolve that really well and then put it out. You know, you don't want it to be hot or cold. Um, you can heat it up to melt the sugar, but you don't have to. You can just you can just stir it to dissolve it. Do not put any red dye in it or anything else, just sugar and water. That's what they need and that's what's best for them. Um, and a very important thing about the feeders is that they have to be cleaned out, emptied out, cleaned out, and replenished frequently. You know, when, when the hummers are really coming through, it's August, September, early October, you know, it's still really hot. And it just takes two, three days before the bacteria levels build up in those feeders. So it's extremely important to clean them out every two to three days. Or whenever you see the, the liquid in the feeder start to get a little, then you know that the bacteria levels are building up. So be sure you clean those. Um, and some people around here in Aransas County, they might uh, put up a bunch of feeders in August, September, maybe 10, 15, 20, you know, just depends. But then um, after the main part of the migration is through, they will still leave out one, one or two or three feeders because there's always a few hummingbirds that, that stay around all year here. So any time of year is a good time to have a feeder out for hummingbirds. Uh, that pink flower, I took that picture, but I don't remember what that plant is. Um, it's not a mist flower, it was, a mu it was much bigger than that. Skip, if you're on, do you know what that is? Can you go the one that's at the hour? Can, no, um, I'd, I'd have to see it. I joined. Yeah, you have to go late. back because I I think I missed okay. it as well. So I I thought you guys would have this memorized. No. Right <laughs> <laughs> here. Still don't see it. You don't see it. Okay. No, still, you're still on Turk's cap. Alrighty, let me see. Oh, that pink flower. Okay, I was on the next slide that I think is mist flower. So, um, it's like a calyandra or something. It it does look like one in the blooms, but the leaves. I'm wondering if those are split like a bohemia of some type, although the flowers don't look like that. Yeah, the leaves I'm quite sure are sort of like a typical legume. Okay, you're probably I'm, right. I'm sorry, I don't remember what it is. All right, we'll find out what it is and get back to you, okay? <laughs> I was afraid someone was going to ask me that. <laughs> yep. Okay, um, if there's not other questions, we'll move on to some of the Hummer's favorite plants. No, you're good to go. The only other question we had was about how often uh, stationary bird baths should be uh, the water should be cleaned out and and I made the suggestion that at least weekly, but probably I like to flush them daily if it's me. So. OK, sounds good. That's it. You can go on. OK, doke. Um, so I'm going to go over several plants that are some of uh, the favorites of hummingbirds. Um, here we always call them hummers, so I slip into that. But anyway, um, Turk's cap is kind of considered their number one favorite plant. And this is uh, a hibiscus family shrub that is native to Texas. It's native to the coastal bend and other parts of Texas. And it has this sort of turban shaped uh, flower that is full of, full of nectar and it stays like this. It stays, it looks kind of closed, um, but the hummers get in there and uh, they can get a lot of nectar out of that. There's also a variety that's native to Mexico and the flowers on that one hang down, but that's another favorite of hummingbirds. These get about two to five feet tall and about three to five feet wide, depending on where they're growing. They're gonna be a little taller and a little more stretched out in the shade but they are one of the few uh, shrubs that does really well in shade. They're naturally an understory plant and they, they will produce a lot of flowers in the shade. So 
They can also grow in full sun though. So it's a, it's a fantastic landscape plant um, for multiple reasons. And they bloom summer, <clears throat> excuse me, summer through fall. Um, the ones at my house right now are loaded with blooms. They have a fairly a, a low water requirement once they're established. And they come in different colors. Red is by far the most common. Um, pink is becoming more available and then sometimes white. And in addition to hummingbirds, they attract butterflies and other wildlife. And here's some shots of uh, how they grow. This one is very well fertilized. It's beautiful, dark green. And just as an aside, um, plants that are growing in shade do not require as much nitrogen as plants that are growing out in the full sun. So they're often gonna be a little darker, darker green. Okay, here's the one of the pink ones. This is this is a variety called Pam per year. So Turk's cap is native, as I said, and then um, the breeder, plant breeders have come up with various varieties by crossing. And so this is one of them, this Pam per year. Um, is a variety that developed from the native one. And you can also see the little red fruit in the center of the uh, center of the picture there of the pink flowers. And that's good for wildlife. People can eat them too. Another favorite is Cenizo or Texas sage. Um, this is not a true sage, like it's not a salvia, but um, we often call it Texas sage. It can also be called barometer bush because when it uh, when we get rain, it bursts into flower. It's another native to the coastal bend and south and west Texas. This one can get pretty big, uh, 10 feet tall easily. Depending on the variety, there are smaller varieties. There's a lot of different varieties, again, that have been developed from this. And about three to 10 feet wide, and it can handle um, it can handle pruning as can the Turk's cap. Turk's cap can be cut back fairly hard in the in the winter. This plant requires full sun to do well. Um, you can see it's got sort of a silverish cast to the leaves and it has hairs on the leaves. That's almost always a sign that that plant developed in full sun. It can reflect some of the sun and it's gonna need full sun. And again, there are some uh, variations in in flower color very low water requirements once it's established it it hardly needs to be watered at all it attracts butterflies as well as hummingbirds and is very deer resistant i don't know what numerous means i put that on there <laughs> i must have forgotten a word okay moving on to the true sages <clears throat> We call these sage or salvia. Salvia is the uh, the scientific genus name. Um, so the names are interchangeable basically. So this is the tropical sage or scarlet sage. Um, again, it's native to Texas. It's very easy to grow. It reseeds readily. It can become almost uh, oh almost too exuberant in the yard if you don't control it. Um, gets a couple to three feet tall and about one foot wide. This can grow also in the shade, grow and flower well in shade. So it's great to have for that and hummingbirds love it. <coughs> Excuse me. And there's quite a few flowers of the, or flower colors of this also. There's uh, white, a nice coral, pink, um, and they all do very well. They don't need a lot of water. They attract butterflies also and other wildlife. And like all the sages, they are deer resistant. They have that strong smell and the deer don't like that. They're not gonna feed on it. So that's definitely a bonus around here. Indigo spires is another very popular sage or salvia that's a cross between two uh, two native species and has this beautiful purple blue flower. This one likes to have more sun than the uh, tropical sage, but it doesn't have to be 100% full sun. Um, 
blooms spring to fall. It's easy, easy to reproduce from seed. Doesn't need a lot of water and deer resistant. <clears throat> and it attracts butterflies and other wildlife. I had a picture of, uh, it goes a swallowtail on sage, on purple sage. Okay, mystic spire salvia or sage is a compact form of indigo spires, the one I showed you just previous to this. And this was um, developed by plant breeders at Texas A&M, and this is a Texas superstar. So again, this is a variety that was developed from the native, uh, the native species. And Texas superstars are plants that have been tested throughout the state do well with fairly minimal inputs and are just good, reliable plants. So Texas superstars are always like a, a pretty sure thing to grow. Uh, one more thing about uh, the salvias <clears throat> is they can all get a little tall and rangy, so it's good to, to cut them back at least once a year, maybe a couple times a year. <clears throat> maybe at uh, maybe in February, and then maybe again midsummer, just to keep them nice and nice and full and bushy. Okay, moving on to crossvine. Uh, this is a beautiful and large. Um, as you can see, it can get up to 50 feet tall or 50 feet long, growing up into a tree, and it is a. Uh, it's a stout vine, so it needs really good support. Um, hummingbirds love this plant. It can grow in sun or part shade. You know, if it's growing up a tree, of course, it's going to be in part shade. It blooms in the spring. It's got these beautiful big orange to yellow red blossoms. Again, does not need a lot of, um, a lot of water. It's a native. It's deer resistant, and it can tolerate brief flooding. But I really want to make the point that you have to have good support for this plant because it, it grows quite large. If you're looking for something that maybe isn't quite so large of a vine, you might want to go with coral honeysuckle. And this should not be confused with the Japanese honeysuckle, which is very invasive. Um, make sure you're getting cori coral honeysuckle and the um, Scientific name is Lonicera semper virens. That's what you need to look for. Um, this is a native, and this grows about 25 feet high, and its its uh, stem is not as fat as the crossvine one. It's not as heavy a plant. Uh, you can grow this on a on a fence or a trellis. It doesn't have to be nearly as as strong as if you're growing crossvine. Again, it can handle sun or part shade. Um, it's going to bloom best if it gets more sun, and it blooms all summer. It's got these beautiful little sort of like a cluster of trumpet flowers that hummingbirds just naturally feed on, and it attracts other wildlife as well as as well as hummingbirds. And it has a a low to medium uh, water requirement. Flame acanthus, which sometimes is called hummingbird plant. Um, again, it's another native, native to central Texas, and it gets about two, three, four feet tall and about three feet wide. Um, it has a low water requirement, but it does have to be watered sometimes, um, which is why it doesn't always do well in my yard, but um, it can grow in sun or part shade, but will produce many more flowers if it's growing in full sun than partial sun. And it blooms summer to fall. These orange to red flowers, it's very striking when it's covered with, with blossoms. And again, this attracts butterflies and other wildlife as well as hummingbirds and is deer resistant. So it's a great one to have uh, out in the front yard. Okay, this is a, another favorite, Esperanza or Yellow Bells, um, another native, native to the coastal bend, south and west Texas, um, gets 
easily in one season can get 10 feet tall and 10 feet wide. And this again, really needs to have full sun to, to bloom well. Um, it's easy to propagate from seed. It, it forms little seed pods. And uh, once those are mature, you can plant the seed or let them drop and, and they will grow. It blooms from spring to fall in this beautiful bright yellow. And there's also a variety, uh, there's various varieties actually of this also. There's a orange one, there's one that's butterscotch colored blossoms and it's called butterscotch. Um, this has a very low water requirement. It also attracts butterflies and is deer resistant. So it's another, it's another winner, I think. And this will sometimes freeze down to the ground. In our area, when we have several days of, of below freezing weather, which does not happen every year, but when it does, um, it'll freeze back to the ground, but it grows back 10 feet tall in, in one summer. The only thing that'll really kill it, I think, is standing water. Do we have any questions at this point? Nope, Skip is taking care of the questions very, very well, so. Okay, excellent. Okay, so I'm gonna now show you a few other plants that are adapted to our area, but not native to it. And the first one is bottle brush. This is a popular landscape plant and in the larger picture on this slide, the bottle brush is in the back. In the front is the firecracker plant, which is also a hummingbird attractor, but um, bottle brush is the one I'm talking about right now. It is native to Australia. It grows all over the place, I think. I mean, anywhere that it doesn't get real cold. And again, there are a lot of varieties that have, have been developed, including um, some sort of dwarf forms. I think one's called Little John. This plant really needs full sun. Um, it and then it'll bring it will bloom spring through summer. These bright red flowers. Um, in our area in Aransas County, they're kind of finishing up their flowering now. So they were blooming well, well into October. These have a little bit higher uh, water requirement than some of the Texas natives, but still not a high one. And they will attract um, butterflies as well as hummingbirds. And are pretty cold hardy. Shrimp plant is another favorite of hummingbirds. This plant is native to Mexico. It gets about three feet tall and Three feet wide, but if you've got a few plants, it it just looks like a like a mass of these flowers that kind of look like shrimps. It grows nice and full and spreads and, and can be really beautiful. Um, it also grows in sun or part shade, does a little bit better blooming in full sun, and it'll bloom most of the year round. Um, in addition to this one that's really shrimp colored, there's a there's one with yellow blooms, uh, redder, there's shades of red and pink and shrimp. Um, white, I haven't seen the white one, but I know there is a white one. And this has a low to medium water requirement and is root hardy. So it can freeze back to the ground and grow when it warms up. It's, a, it's a, an easy to grow plant. And this is firebush, um, or it's often called Hamelia. It's scientific genus. This is native to Mexico. Uh, it does extremely well here. It's another one that you can uh, cut back or might freeze back to the ground almost and will be 10 feet tall in a few months. Once, once the weather warms up and it starts growing, it grows fast can easily get to 12 feet tall and eight feet wide. But as I said, it can <clears throat> it can handle being being cut back quite a bit. Um, it grooms, it blooms. <laughs> I just see that I put gall instead of fall. 
it blooms summer to fall. Um, mine are slowing down right now, but they are still blooming a little bit and I still see uh, creatures on there. A lot of bees right now that are sucking up the sucking up the nectar. It has a low water requirement. Uh, once it's established, it really doesn't have to be watered at all. It attracts a lot of a lot of insects and birds. And is deer resistant. So it's another it's another winner. Easy to grow, well adapted, um, produces all these beautiful flowers. Creatures love it. It's feeding the wildlife. Um, it's various heights, so it's it's just a great plant. And again, it's root hardy, so it can freeze back to the ground and grow again. So uh, what we're really looking for, as I mentioned earlier, is various levels of plants, flowers that are at different heights, different different areas for hummingbirds to hang out in, to perch, to feel protected, and to feed. And these are just some examples. This obviously is our demonstration garden here that our master gardeners uh, plant and maintain, but you can see lots of different flowering plants. Uh, Esperanza kind of on the center left there, uh, wild olive in the back, the white flowers. Um, there's a Cenizo in front of the wild olive that's not blooming in this picture, firecracker plant in the front. So you've got, again, a variety of plants, a variety of growth habits, um, flowers blooming at different times. Uh, this is a great habitat for hummingbirds. And just a few more. I didn't show any pictures of, of wildflowers before this, but um, look at that variety. And again, there's trees above, so they are they have some protection from predators. So variety is the spice of life. Isn't that what they told us? And it is kind of the key to wildlife. Wildlife needs uh, needs variety. Uh, things are are interdependent. Interdependent. Um, it's they are not hummingbirds are not just going to come to a garden because there is a couple plants that they like to feed feed the nectar. <clears throat> Excuse me, feed on the nectar. So we need trees, large ones, small ones, shrubs, annuals, wildflowers, vines, ground covers, um, all of that to attract hummingbirds and have a healthy garden. And that is the end of my slideshow. <clears throat> so are there any any other questions? Yes, ma'am, you have a question about sky flower if uh, it's a good good plant for hummingbirds or not. Yes, sky flower, which is also called Duranta or golden dewdrop. I'm assuming that's the one they mean by sky flower. Um, yes, that is a good hummingbird plant. It's got all those little bitty flowers uh, that they will feed on. Um, it has a nice full habit and it's about, it's a shrub that gets about, oh, four, four to five feet maybe and several feet wide. Um, it provides a good, a good habitat for insects and for hummingbirds. It's a good one. It's not a native, but it is well adapted. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, you have a question about whether you should have flowers or feeders or or is a combination better? Oh, that's a good question. Um, probably a combination is better. I mean, maybe it would be ideal to uh, have enough flowers that the hummers could just feed on that because they are going to get other things uh, from flowers that they might not get from the nectar. But having um, having flowers with feeders to supplement is excellent. Um, that is that's great. 
then then there's always food available for them. Um, that's ideal, probably. I wouldn't try to do just just feeders. Um, they need to have some flowers, and of course, they need, as I said, shelter and all that. Okay, hey, can you talk a little bit about some of your favorite plants for uh, hummingbirds that can be grown easily in pots? Sure. Um, let me go back to some. Turk's cap can be grown in a pot if it, um, in a good size pot. And that is one of my favorite plants, hummingbird or not. Um, it's just a great plant. And as I've said, it's native. Um, so it does well in pots. Um, the Texas sage or Cenizo does, except for the small varieties, um, I would, probably wouldn't plant that in a pot, but I would plant the true sages or salvias in pots. I do at my house all the time, um, especially the, the blue and purple ones, which don't seem to want to grow in my yard. Um, they do great in pots and they can be cut back to the ground, even in a pot. At the end of the winter, um, seeds that drop are gonna are gonna sprout in the in the spring, so they do really well in pots, and they're beautiful. Um, let's see what else. Esperanza, if you had a large enough pot, um, they can do very well in a container. Again, it's a great plant. And uh, firebush does quite well in a container, again, if it's large enough. Um, but I think the salvias are especially um, adapted to growing in pots. Hey, you have a question about spirea, spirea, spirea. Um, hmm. will, it, will it work here? It's great for hummingbirds in places where it grow well here. What about in places where it grows? I didn't catch that. Um, well, I I grew up with with Berea, so I know oh. it's great for humming, attracting hummingbirds. Oh. But can you talk about whether it can be grown here or not? You know, I am not completely sure. I think I don't think this is its favorite uh, place to grow. I don't see much of it around, but I think it probably can. Maybe maybe Skip, do you have an answer on that one? I'm sorry. Does Spirea you, do well in the Gulf Coast? Uh, there's the white bridal wreath type, and I've seen it down in the Houston area. I haven't seen, I haven't noticed further south than toward y'all's region. And then there's some colored types that are kind of a rose colored blooms that are, I generally see further up in East Texas. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I cannot think of whether I've seen it down here. Any other questions? I want to remind people that um, this presentation will be sent out to you um, so you can refer to it at your leisure. And also we will be sending a an evaluation that would be we would really appreciate if you would fill that out it it only takes a few minutes ginger you guys have put together some awesome uh, materials as well from the extension office down there your plant guide and stuff that i don't know if you yes. shared, shared that with this group uh but it, it's awesome can you put that do you have that link available to put in the chat i can share it uh, I'll yeah. go, go ahead tell, go ahead and tell them about your your coastal gardens book and I'll uh, add the link in. OK, uh, we have a book called In Our Coastal Gardens that the Aransas and Patricia Master Gardeners Association has put together and refined over the years. They um, they redesigned it a few years back to a different format and it's a fantastic resource. Um, it lists plants only plants that are either native or adapted to the coastal bend and they're grouped by their habit so trees 
large trees, small trees, large and small shrubs, um, perennials, ground covers. Uh, it's got a section of tropicals, grasses, and then it has photographs and it tells whether they need uh, the growing conditions they need, sunlight, water, uh, what kind of wildlife they attract. And well, it's just birds, hummingbirds, um, and I think general, whether it's salt tolerant, gives a little, some notes on whether it does well in sand or clay. And it's a fantastic resource and you can view it online um, at the link that, that Kevin is sharing with you. Or you can stop by our office and pick one up when you're down this way. It actually won first place uh, in the uh, Texas Master Gardener Association contest uh, or competition a couple of years ago, the year that it came out. First place for publications. Ginger, uh, someone asked about when to prune lantana. Uh, I'm assuming down along the Gulf Coast area. Uh, I would prune it oh, like December, January, February. If it starts looking raggedy before that, I'd, I'd do it then. Um, basically, you want to cut it down before the spring growth starts. And you can cut it pretty severely, but, you know, just a little bit above the ground. I want to mention to anybody listening that's not watching the chat, uh, Kevin did put that link. Uh, to Ginger's publication in the chat. And I also put a link, uh, someone asked where to view Ginger's palm program. And I put a link to the palm program as well as all the other gardening on the Gulf Coast programs. So if you'd like to go over there and click on it, you'll, you'll be able to access palms and the others as well. Awesome. We had another question, Ginger, about the red liquid. Um, I know you mentioned don't put it in there. I think someone's kind of wondering about is well, maybe why is that bad? Or, or I, I think you said already it wasn't necessary. So do you want to comment a little more about that? Because it's really a common thing for people to feel like they need to dye the water red. Yes, it's, it's not at all necessary. Um, the hummers are going to be attracted to the feeders, um, partly because they have seen other birds feeding on it. But uh, there's some, some evidence that says that it may be damaging to the birds. The, you know, it's not a natural dye, so it's not something they come across and may be bad for them. So it's better to just totally avoid it. And there's, there's no advantage in having it. And just a little plug for our, our Hummerbird uh, celebration here. It's usually the third week of September and it goes through from Thursday through Sunday. And, you know, this year was unusual, of course, but usually we have maybe about 20 or more what's called Hummer homes where you can drive around on a self-guided self -guided tour and just get out sit in people's yard, their front yard or their backyard, however they have it set up and uh, watch the hummingbirds. And there'll be hun hundreds or thousands of them, uh, well, hundreds of them maybe at one house, but um, it's pretty incredible. And then there's talks and there's vendors and all kinds of presentations, including things about plants, about hummingbirds and about other birds. There's always a group that comes in um, that has raptors and they, fly around the auditorium, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, I see, <clears throat> excuse me, the question about red glass feeders versus clear glass. I don't know of any evidence that, that the red glass feeders um, attract any more birds than the clear glass ones. Um, 
they are attracted to red, but they're attracted to other colors too. And somehow they seem to know that um, that there's that there's feed in there, that there's something in there good for them, and they uh, they will come to the feeders if you put them out. And yes, they do hog the feeders. Um, they are extremely territorial, and uh, kind of drives me crazy to watch them. Um, because they spend a lot of energy chasing the other ones away and they could just be sitting there drinking. But but the solution to that is to have multiple feeders out. And yes, as Kevin said, to space them out, maybe put them far enough apart that they don't even see each other. Um, but I have been to houses on the Hummer tour where every feeder is just, you know, has maybe eight, they have eight to 10 holes for feeding and they're just want every feeder is completely full so it just depends i guess on on how hungry they are at that moment ginger is it the rufus hummingbird that is a year-round native here do you know the answer to that mm. i know we have one or two species that stay here year-round yes i know sometimes there are people people have rufus that stay that do stay year round, but I don't, I think most of the Rufus do migrate. Um, I don't really have a better answer than that. I don't know of any that stay, that all of them stay here year round. All right, thank you. Do we have any more questions this morning? All right, well, we want to, um yeah here's a question a person has problems with ants and they found a feeder with a bowl at the top that uh has water in it so can you talk about ant proofing your hummingbird feeders it can be a big problem um there are like she said the ones with the sort of like a moat that the ants can't get across um but you can also put <clears throat> something like Vaseline on the, uh, the hanger of the feeder, because of course they're gonna have to crawl to it. They can't fly to it. Um, so if you can block them from crawling down onto the feeder, your problem solved. So either block them with water, with the moat that uh, you can buy the ones that have that, or just put uh, Vaseline or something like that on the, on the hanger itself. All right, well that, that seems to be all the questions, Ginger. Um, we wanna thank all of you for joining us this morning. We especially wanna thank Ginger for uh, uh, doing such a terrific presentation. And I wanna thank Skip Richter for uh, assisting in answering questions this morning. We wanna remind you that um, there's no program on November the 11th or November the 25th because of holidays that, that makes our next presentation on homeowner chemical and, and uh, personal protective equipment safety on November the 18th. So please join us for that program. Uh, and once again, thank you for allowing us to come in and be a part of uh, the educational programs during uh, this pandemic. And uh, we hope you uh, continue to enjoy the Gulf Coast Gardening online series. Thank you all and have a great day. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Kevin and Skip.